Hi everybody. It is May the 10th. We made it. Woo <laughs> Another month. <laughs> Another month I'm not evicted. Woo um, I know this whole comment about not being evicted has been going on for like over a year now. Uh, and you would think that they would shut or get off the pot, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's just been an ongoing thing. So it's, but it is really stressful to every day be checking the mail for, you know, inspection notices. And I mean, the whole thing is just ridiculous. Um, but anyway, I'm not here to complain about my personal life. I'm here to talk about books because we all love books. And it is, as I talked about last year, May is considered Asian American month. And it is also short story month. Now, last year I started reading a collection called Black Cranes and I reviewed the first half. I'd like to get to the second half of it this year. Um, next week, or actually, no, it's this coming weekend now because today's Tuesday. Um, but this upcoming weekend is going to be the Stoker Awards. And I took a look at uh, Tortured Willows, which is a collection of poetry that was, that sort of came out of the conversations, uh, from what I can gather, uh, held around the Black Cranes uh, project. So, and, and this is also Stoker nominated. And I started reading it last month because April's poetry month, but I didn't get a whole lot finished last month. So with that, that introduction, here's the cover art. So you can have a quick, uh, you can see it's very similar to the previous uh, collection. These covers are just great. They really, um, I think they really nail what the projects are about and they're intriguing and they're dangerous and they're uh, pretty to look at and uh, they just really, uh, they, they, they really pop for me. Um, I mean, they're not as, I mean, obviously they're not I don't know how to explain what I'm trying to say. I don't know. <laughs> I just think that the, the cover art is, uh, is pretty intriguing. Um, so Tortured Willows is a collection of po poems by four authors. And, and I thought that was really interesting to start with because as a poetry reader, I'll usually get a chapbook or a longer work by one author or I, or a collection of poetry and anthology by a number of authors. Uh, so to have longer works by four different authors is a really unique way to do things. So I'm going to try to not make this review too, too long, um, but I can't help really kind of gushing about uh, this work because I really, really enjoyed it. So I'm going to give it five out of five stars. Now, uh, the first, now, Black Cranes was, was edited by Lee Murray and uh, Janine Flynn, and Murray, Flynn, Christina Singh, and Angela Eureka Smith are the authors who contributed to, to these poems. Um, and each one takes a look uh, at different themes. Each author takes a look at different themes of what it is like to be an, a woman of Asian descent, to be living in the diaspora, meaning moved to other places than Central Asia, or sorry, uh, Southeast Asia, and the roles and expectations and cliches and um, all of the ways that Asian women are viewed both culturally and uh, sort of by the, uh, by the larger audience, I guess, and also within their own experiences, in their families, their histories. Um, and it sounds like an awful lot to unpack, but each... I think each poem is very, very experiential and personal, but also speaks to broader themes. And I think that that really uh, speaks to the just 
I mean, each of these poems could be a masterclass. I mean, it, it, I really, I enjoyed reading this because I um, have dabbled in poetry. It's been a very long time since I wrote poetry, but this is the kind of stuff that I really like to just kind of just experience and read and think about as a writer and as a reader. And, um, and it's the kind of stuff I aspire to as a writer as well. So, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna have I'm gonna try to take a look at each author, but try not to gush too much about it. So Lee Murray is the first author in 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 the collection, and she is a third generation Chinese New Zealander, and um oh another thing that I forgot is. Many of the poems, not all of them, but many of the poems have a little explanation after the poem so you can tell what, what inspired it and how it was written. Um, so she writes uh, about experiences uh, just with her her family coming to a new place and trying to adjust and being the only kid that looked like she did and the... Um, I guess just the, the juxtaposition of the hit family history and mythology with personal experiences. Um, so the one, one that really stood out to me was the girl with the bellows and it's about her mother taking her to see a movie called Mao's Last Dancer. And in the, I guess in the film, there's just a little tiny clip of, of a, a very small girl uh, operating a bellows to, to fan a flame. And it says here, in a three second clip from the plains of Shandong, the girl with the bellows fanning unquiet fires. From the plains of Shandong, I followed her through time, fanning unquiet fires. Look, this is me, she said. And she goes on to explain that uh, the inspiration, which she wrote about in the horror tree, um, was that she wrote it after seeing this uh, 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 this feeling of connection with uh, people who share her experiences. And she said that uh, her mother took her to see this movie, and her mother saw it three times. And she says, half an hour into the movie, the main character returned to his family home in a remote char farming village in China. Her mother gripped her arm tightly. There, she said, indicating the toddler operating the bellows who was fanning the wood fire and keeping it alight. That was me. That was my job. Sixty years on, her New Zealand-born Chinese mother had finally found her own childhood experience in that tiny snip of film. It meant so much to her that she went back to see the movie three times in one week representation matters and I thought that was really um I mean it was a lovely tribute to her mother but at the same time the depiction of this this poor village and this this little toddler who's working um in a dangerous environment and who's even watching her um is a little bit shocking and this isn't even nearly as shocking as some of the uh the imagery gets and uh the next one that I really enjoyed by Lee Murray this one was just great. Um, it was called At the Bar. He grins. Asian girls. You know what they say. What do they say? Nice slits. I grin too. Later I oblige him with my boning knife. Let that settle for a second. Now I thought that was a really, really uh, good poem. Um, because I can't imagine being on the receiving end of that, but I grew up with a racist mother who would tell those kind of kinds of jokes, uh, about, you know, people she didn't even know. And I thought, I mean, what a horrible thing to say about somebody you don't even know. Um, and I appreciated this one in particular, I, I guess, because it's such a short poem, but it says so much. I mean, each each word is so 
heavily weighted and you've got the interplay of sex and violence um, and it also reminds me a little bit of this poem by Margaret Atwood uh, it's called The Hook and it's uh, the Margaret Atwood poem goes something like you fit into me like a hook into an eye a fish hook an open eye and there's that sense of just even the moment of connection is a violent one and I also really liked the play on slits and boning being the term, obviously, for both intercourse, but also for taking the bones out of a fish. So, and and again, um, I mean, it just, it, it, each image just has layers and layers and layers. And I mean, a boning knife, you, you can easily see uh, a fisherman in a village using it to do his work and then to use it to this kind of purpose. Um, anyway, I, I just, I really appreciate this kind of uh, simplicity on the surface, but uh, it really looks at um, years and layers of racism and sexism and um, stereotypes. And uh, there's just so much in such a very, very short short poem and I, I really appreciated this one alrighty so the next one that I really liked okay so yeah just a little bio is the ending about Lee Murray multi-award winning author editor from New Zealand uh, she's written a number of books a number of Stoker Awards and you can check out her website, leemurray.info. Uh, now, the next author in the book is Janie Flynn. Uh, she's Chinese, descended from a line of Hakka women. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, and the second thing that I found, or well, second thing, <laughs> another thing that I found really interesting about this was that collectively we look at Asian people as stereotypes. A little more refined, we might think, you know, are you Chinese? Are you Korean? Are you Japanese? Are you... But even within... I mean, China's a big fucking place <laughs> with a lot of people, right? Um, but as, you know, an ignorant white Westerner, it, sometimes you forget that there are just so many, many different smaller parts to the culture and to be able to read about uh this kind of history is really interesting um because it says here that the Hakka originated in the north and migrated southward never truly assimilated assimilating with the native population in south china shunning practices such as foot binding and holding key positions of command during the taiping rebellion and she has Fuju blue blah, 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 blah. Fuju, if I'm pronouncing that right, I apologize. Blood on her father's side, Southern Fujian Fujian has rich operate operatic and bla, balladic tradition. <sighs> That's a mouthful. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what I find interesting about Jenny Flynn's contribution is that most of her poems explore different forms of poetry. And now most of us are probably familiar with either, you know, your your rhyming poetry or your sonnets, maybe maybe a villanelle or and your kind of confessional TikTok teen angst stuff. But there are so many different forms of poetry most of us don't really get exposure to. So there's um So there's, so the first one is a pantoum, which is a Malay poetic, po poetic form. Uh, there's a blackout poem here. There's a sonnet. Um, there's a, it's called a contrapuntal form, which is to kind of back-to-back -back poems that look at the different 
perspectives of the characters. Um, she also Right. Okay, so the next one is a murder ballad where she talks about the unsolicited advice from her aunties. Now, I'm sure um, many, many, many cultures <laughs> have aunties that give unsolicited, unsolicited advice. I'm an auntie, and every time I give anybody advice, I get smacked down. So. <laughs> um, and then this poem I found was really interesting because the subject matter has been interesting to me. It's called Bride Price, and it's about a... Uh, the practice of ghost marriage. And she points out that it's a tragic irony that a woman is worth more as a corpse than when she is alive. Another one about uh, hungry ghosts and a poetic form called a roundabout. So yeah, there's a lot of really, really good uh, expressions. Uh, just to, she, uh, Jenny Flynn isn't only exploring the themes and the subject. She's also exploring the forms of poetry. Um, uh, acrostic poems, rental life. So yeah, there's, I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm trying to find one short one that I can just kind of talk about. Um, but I think of, but I think I liked this uh, last one. Um, now I love a villanelle. And <laughs> it's about a fear of drowning. Um, and Jenny Flynn writes that she watched Jaws far too young and has carried a fear of something moving in deep water ever since. And uh, it's called What You Cannot See. You drift in water, blue to black, and still. Like lips taste salt. You find you've lost your way. You think it will not matter, but it will. At first you swim, slow-eyed and stroke, until you think you reach the safety of the bay. You drift in water, blue to black, and still. A heaving something brushes you, a frill. You know its voice. You know what it will say. You think it will not matter, but it will. Listen. Be good. Be small, not woman, girl. Serve, bend back, bend over, smile, obey. You drift in water, blue to black, and still. Did it catch you? Did it take its fill? Do you learn to fight it? Well, you may. You think it will not matter, but it will. It comes with teeth and rolling eye and gill, and swallows whole your chance to get away. You drift in water, blue to black, and still. You think it will not matter, but it will. I love the Villanelle. <laughs> um, so she she also writes about how just, she said the moment when as a girl she realized what she would face as a woman and how that knowledge ambushed her. And I, I think it's a really powerful uh, look at all of, the fears of the unknown, uh, especially um, as a woman with the expectations sort of pulling you down. And um, oops, sorry. So the next selection is by Christina Singh. She's fourth generation Singaporean Chinese. And again, uh, her she says her grandparents were Piranakan and Teochew Cantonese. I'm sorry if I'm butchering that. And her maternal parent, grandparents were Hakka and Cantonese. And she writes about the horror stories and mythology she grew up from. And uh, Christina Singh's uh, poetry subject matter is a lot more ghosts, uh, a lot more sort of deals more with horror and uh, people experiencing um, more direct supernatural uh, sorts of things. Um, trying to find the one. There was one in here that I really, really liked. And it, it, yeah, and it's more straight up horror poetry, uh, which I have never 
been able to write very well, but I've always enjoyed and I've always wanted to kind of give my, to try my hand at it. So this is the one that I liked of hers and it's kind of a longer one. Um, and that, that was another theme that I found I really appreciated was just that, that look at traditions um, and how we don't really, I mean, we, we can see the movies, we can watch the cliches, but we don't uh, get that kind of firsthand feeling from it. And, and I appreciate how um, each of these poems, whenever it uses personal experience, it really does feel like you're, you're just right in the moment of it. So this one is pretty good. It's called The Offering. Each year during the ghost month, when the hell gates open, the woman places an offering to her dead parents below her apartment block. She hopes her words and well wishes reach them in the afterlife. As she embraces her young son with tired, bruised arms, wondering when her pain will end, wondering when she can join them, down storms her husband, carrying their crying newborn, shoving her in her mother's arms. It was 15 minutes too long, he yells, kicking the offerings all around. Crying, the woman and her son carefully pick up the food and place them back onto their plates, asking her parents for courage to do what must be done. She hands the baby to her brother, who gently coos her to sleep. Quietly, she returns home and grabs the backpack she left in the meter box. Inside, her husband is raging. Heart pounding with panic, she tiptoes back to her children and they leave silently fingers to lips as if it is a game, running to the nearby church where they curl up on a bench by the grotto. The sound of the waterfall soothes and calms, as does the statue of a mother watching over them. Of all the places in the world, he will never step foot in here. Of this, she is certain. Soon, sleep mercifully takes them. In the morning, the custodian discovers them and offers them food and safe haven. By evening, the police find them after canvassing the area. She hears the news. Her husband is dead. They found him in their home, eyes wide in terror. Likely scared to death, the police tell her. Neighbors heard him screaming all night like someone being tortured, screaming like someone was tearing off his head. They only called 999 in the morning, after a shower. Don't anger the spirits, they say, not during ghost month, when the hell gates are wide open. She nods, understanding, making another offering. This time, she whispers, thank you. Um, this one gave me some chills, partly because it's kind of a scary, scary thought, but also because I have a ghost who's an asshole, who is always writing nasty things to me, throwing my stuff around, but I don't know what I did to anger it. And I get annoyed with it because... It keeps throwing my stuff around. I'm like, stop breaking my stuff. You can live here if you want. Just stop breaking my stuff. And then my sister's like, well, you pissed it off. And I said, well, if it doesn't like me, it can leave. <laughs> it doesn't pay rent. Yes, I know. I sound like a lunatic when I say that stuff. But anyway, so maybe I should be a little... I, I have tried being nice to the ghost and reaching out to it, but it doesn't tell me what it wants. So we're not very comfortable uh, fellows. <laughs> Oh, and there's a poem here about the Pontianuk, which uh, we discussed uh, at a, in another place, in another video interview. Um, all righty. So, anyway, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of, of really good monster poems here. And uh, again, Christina Singh, uh, born and raised in Singapore, um, many accolades for her poetry and fiction, essays, art. And the last one, the last author is Angela Eureka Smith. Um, now I thought this one was also, uh, really just an unusual look at a culture I didn't know very much about. I mean, the only time I heard the word Okinawa was in the Karate Kid, right? Um... And the introduction 
she wrote she writes that she this opened up a Pandora's box. Uh, she began write, by writing about how her grandmother lost her name, Yuriko, because it was difficult to pronounce. And I'm, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, too. I don't know where the stress is. Maybe it's Yuriko? I, I don't know. Um, she says that she scratched the surface of what it means to be Okinawan, or accurately, Uchinachu. It's not about a woman losing her voice, but a culture of people losing much more. And each poem deals with uh, the history of Okinawa, which I would be interested in reading more about. And I guess, um, I mean, the long story short is that Okinawa was invaded and then they didn't even want it. They sold it. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to find something that's... Uh, there was one here that was really interesting. Um, and she also writes about personal experience with ghosts. Uh, there's a scary Japanese ghost called the Nukekubi, which is a head attached to entrails. And she says that when she was 13, uh, this floating head chased her out of the house in broad daylight. And it's a pretty, that would be a very scary experience. And she said it sounds like the same ghost. Um, I am actually looking for something. A uh, uh, video in Japanese about the most haunted place in Okinawa. Uh, like I said, each of these is, is such an interesting... Oh, here, here it was. Uh, Chibichiri Gama is a cave where c civilian Okinawans hid during the landing of U.S. forces on April 1st, 1945. The Imperial Japanese Army told the villagers that the Americans would kill their children, rape and torture them all to death. The Imperial Army handed out poison and hand grenades so the Uchinanchu could kill themselves rather than, being taken, rather than be taken alive by U.S. soldiers. That's just so, so, so sad. Of 140 hiding civilians, 84 died. And there's a couple of poems about this uh, particular. This is the one that I was looking for. <clears throat> Called Outside Chibichiragama. There was no more room in Chibichiragama for a young mother, her boy and baby. They waited outside the cave, hoping for a space while the world filled up. A flying shrapnel and smoke, a shard cut through her. The baby still nursed, covered in her mother's blood, while her brother screamed. The two children lived until the rains came that night and washed their souls down to nourish the roots of their final resting place, together in death. Where are the medals for the mothers and children that gave everything for a war not theirs? A story in the New York Times in 1996 reports an eyewitness account from a man who lived through the event. Then a boy, he saw a mother and two little ones trying to take shelter in the tree. The mother was killed by shrapnel. The baby continued to nurse. It rained all night. The next morning he went to check on them and found the children had joined their mother. So there, there it was. Oh, that, that was one. Inu genie means to die in vain, a sacrifice with no point. Uh, translated as to, dog, to die a dog's death, nothing was accomplished. When the Americans won, they took the Raikayu, sorry, I'm not pronouncing that right, islands as their own. The Uchinanchu people left starved. When the Americans left, they gave Okinawa to Japan. To this day, they seek to regain control of their land. So these are... Um, These, these poems are a mix of personal, but also uh, historical horror. And I thought that that was an interesting subject. Um, I think it would be... I would read it if she would write a novel about the subject, about 
these people or somebody uh, from that time. Uh, historical novels. I don't even know. <laughs> anyway, uh, Angela Eureka Smith is a third generation Amer uh, Uchinanchu American poet, author, and publisher with over 20 years' experience in newspaper journalism. Uh, she started writing her f speculative fiction in 2011 with the, the end of May, and m again, more accolades. So I've been kind of blathering on for a while. I guess I should probably stop because I can go on about this all day, but I really enjoyed this collection. I hope you enjoyed having a look at it with me. Hope you're reading lots of great horror. Have a great day.